Hello everyone and welcome to the Gunpla Network. I'm the Spicer and today's episode of Ships and Stuff is brought to you by Side 7 Exports, the one-stop shop for all your P-Bandai and Gundam Base exclusive needs. Be sure when you place that order, you use the promo code Gunpla Network 10 at checkout for 10% off. Speaking of Side 7, the giveaway for the Hardgraph Core Fighter is being delayed. Um, if you're not familiar, back on the Ptolemyos 2 video, we're doing a giveaway for the Hardgraph Core Fighter. It is still happening, just being delayed due to COVID. Thank you for your understanding, and now back into the video. Today we'll be diving deep into the evolution of Gundam's alternative universes. You see, over Gundam's 40-year history, we've seen many changes to the quote-unquote Gundam formula, thanks largely in part to the vast number of alternative universes that have been created. Gundam's had an interesting history of blurring the line of alternative universe and main story, and that brings us to our ground rules. Number one, we're only going to be using the UC for context. We're not really going to examine it. This does include all of the UC early and late, Turn A Gundam and Rekingi Stin G. While they're not formal UC, they're close enough and really deserve their own deep dive. Number two, we're only going to be examining animation, so series, OVAs, movies, and shorts. We're not going to take a look at any manga, video games, radio dramas, or stage plays. Sorry, Double O fans. And before we get too deep, I want to just kind of give a little aside on TV ratings. The percentages given are the percentage of TVs tuned into the show while it was airing in Japan or a specific region it was being broadcast in. While these percentages can seem low, it is important to note they can represent millions of people, so I'll try to break that down, but just keep that in mind. Now to your Unicorn Gundams, to time travel back to the edgy, adrenaline-filled year of 1988? Wait, hold on, that, that's not right, let me check my notes, let's, hold on, this is, let's, uh, okay, let's carry the two and then uh, move this here, okay. Oh, eight, 1988 brought us SD Gundam, a light-hearted parody featuring our favorite mobile suits and characters. However, before we get too deep, into SD, it's important to note where it falls in the Gundam lineage. 1988 was part of one of the biggest eras for the UC, and I've got just the person to help cover it. Taking us back to 1986 was Zeta Gundam. Did you say Zeta Gundam? Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam brought the Universal Century into prominence, providing a deep, complex story in the middle of the sci-fi boom of the 1980s. Airing in 1986, and hitting an all-time high for Gundam ratings, as it should have, at an average of 6.6%, Zeta put Gundam on the map in a big way. With Double Zeta following in 1987, with an average rating of 6.1%, it led right into a milestone for Gundam, Char's Counterattack, the first feature film to be released in theaters that ended the decade-long rivalry of Amuro and Char. While Sunrise was enjoying the critical success, Bandai's bottom line wasn't seeing the same love, it turns out older teens love stories about abused teens' emotional struggles, the futility of war, complex political drama, and the threat of planet-wide genocide. But the kids weren't feeling it, and Bandai needed something to appeal to younger audiences. SD brought some much-needed levity and humor to the franchise, something it had largely been missing. It also wouldn't hurt to help drive toy sales with more child-friendly designs. With SD Gundam's cartoonish parody of itself, it could appeal to kids and older fans alike with these chibi or rather SD designs being incredibly popular among kids. This gave Bandai another series to mine for plastic, and while I couldn't track down any exact toy lines, Gashapon had been using these designs for capsule toys for a few years, and Bandai had seen a lot of success with the SD BB Senshi line starting in 1987. Seeing this success, Bandai and Sunrise followed it up with the introduction of a series of movies, OVA series, and a TV compilation ending in 1993. SD helped Bandai reach a newer, younger audience as Zeta, Double Zeta, and Char's Counterattack had seen a huge jump in who they were targeting. 
SD started the push for two primary target markets, children and teens. It's hard to balance catering to both, and we'll see it time and time again, and sometimes not so successfully in the future, but Bandai's strategy of trying to widen their appeal wasn't really revolutionary or even new. However, they would begin toying with this idea over the next 30 years. Heading into the 1990s, it's important to note where the UC stood, as it would largely impact Bandai's business plan for this decade. After Char's counterattack, the UC had five releases over the next 10 years. In 1989, Mobile Suit Gundam 0080 War in the Pocket brought us a more interpersonal drama focused on individual struggles instead of the broader strokes of the one year war. In 1991, F91 was released in theaters, moving us into the late UC of Universal Century 0153 and taking place outside of the Earth Sphere, the first Universal Century show to do so. Running from 1991 to 1992 was Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 Stardust Memories, which got back to more traditional Gundam fare and helped cover the seven year gap between Mobile Suit Gundam's One Year War and Zeta Gundam's conflicts culminating in the Neo Zeon War. Airing from 1993 to 1994 was Victory Gundam, which would be the only full-length series for the Universal Century to air in the 90s. And it brought us back to the late UC even going further than F91. Lastly, running from 1996 to 1999 was the OA-MS team, a down-to-earth gritty take on the one-year war in Southeast Asia. Now, if you're keeping track at home, yes, that is stories from the UC consistently being released for 15 years. While some are more notable than others, there are a few infamous stories in that period. Well, War in the Pocket, Stardust Memories, and OA-MS team received praise. They would be lauded for their character stories and design work. Some didn't fare so well. Sadly, F91 had problems from the start, being cut short after only the first 13 episodes had been planned out. This was largely due to a staffing dispute, and while well, Tomino and Okawara would return to help steer the ship, these cuts and edits were... A pretty big misstep in a largely successful UC at this point. And while Victory Gundam followed this up with a full length series, it had its own set of problems. In an effort to make the UC more kid friendly, especially with SD Gundam no longer being on any kind of screen, it was decided to have the new protagonist be 13 years old to help relate to kids. However, this partnered with one of the highest mortality rates of any cast in Gundam led to an incredibly morbid show with rather poor ratings, coming in at 3.9% on average. While the oath MS team would help rebound the Universal Century, it was spread out over three years, and this really gave Bandai and Sunrise a lot of space to experiment. While toy and SD model sales had started to decline, Bandai did see Victory Gundam increase the sale of the quote-unquote normal model kits. However, it did still miss Bandai's sell forecasting numbers of 10 million units sold. Well, that's kind of a silver lining. Bandai and Sunrise knew a new strategy would be needed to help keep younger audiences engaged. With their bottom line at stake, Bandai got to work figuring out this all-important issue. They wanted to give Gundam a shiny new coat of paint and saw the booming popularity of the shonen genre with shows like Kira Toriyama's Dragon Ball Z. Bandai wanted a piece of that Goku-shaped cake really bad. They needed it. So the big bosses of Bandai and Sunrise went down to Sunrise Studio Number 1 and said, Hey, stop working on that stupid serious war drama stuff. We got the punch fights to make. And ran out of the room most likely to try to find the next big thing, which inevitably would be boy bands. So Studio One pondered this and they came back with their answer to this request and that answer would require lots and lots of skin tight latex. <laughs> Taking place in the future century, Mobile Fighter G Gundam follows Neo Japan's Gundam fighter Domon Kashu, 
a star martial artist seeking revenge for his family's destruction at the hands of his brother Kyoji. This should really be no surprise as Gundam's just a trashy reality show with robots. As the 13th Gundam fight begins to see which country will hold dominion over the space colonies for the next four years, Domon searches for his brother, trains, falls in love, and learns the power of friendship. All shown in qualities. G Gundam's over-the-top bombastic tone more closely resembled the super robot subgenre than the grounded real robot of the Universal Century, which left many existing fans on the fence. G Gundam is rather interesting as it wasn't the original project Studio One had been working on. After Victory Gundam's poor ratings, Bandai and Sunrise were trying to get as far away from the UC as possible in as little time as possible. So they cancelled the then-in-progress Polkarano Gundam, a war drama centered around the conflict between Earth and Mars. This is also commonly referred to as Polka Gundam as it's much easier to say. This concept may sound a little familiar as well, as several key members of this team went on to help produce the Crossbone Gundam manga. While the Switch wasn't the most welcome news, the team worked hard and series director Yoshiro Amagawa felt that G Gundam had achieved a lot through the changing of the Gundam formula. The team tried its best to keep some level of reality in the show, wanting to use a large range of locations to help keep the Earth of the Future Century feeling real, and Imagawa even cited a lot of Western film and TV influences to help give a lot of the side characters in Gundam more grounded, realistic feels. Starting in 1994 and ending in 1995, it picked up right where SD Gundam had left off, but taking a more mature tone, but not necessarily as mature as the UC. G tried its best to tell a serious story in what amounted to the Gundam Olympics with some magic robot bullshit in between. And has a ton of fun with the concept and subverted a ton of Gundam norms in the process. G Gundam was something you could actually play as a kid as well, capturing the shonen spirit with special fighting moves inspired by martial arts and super robot-esque gimmicks made this really the perfect thing to play on the playground of the 1990s. It did make progress in terms of ratings as well, averaging 4.1%. While a small increase from Victory Gundam, it should be noted Japan's total population at this point is about 125 million people. Even if 25 million didn't have TVs, you're still looking around 4.1 million people roughly. Well, not the actual number, just to give you an idea of how many people could be tuning in. And how big of a difference 0.2% can make. This showed that Gundam could shake off its war drama lineage and still do well, if not better, than what it had been. It also found success in the West, as Gundam Wing had initially introduced everyone and did about as well, but we're gonna save all that till we get to the 2000s. This also marked progress for Bandai's model kit game, as they introduced such monikers as High Grade in 1990 and the first Master Grade would come out in 1995. With flashier designs, Bandai had a plethora of new plastic crack to sell to the masses, even leaving Gundam Wing producer Hideyuki Tomioka to say that the G Gundam kits activated the plastic model market, which had been stagnant until then. G Gundam had done well, but would this success continue? And that future would be boy bands. And that brings us to new Mobile Report Gundam Wing. Dragging us into the After Colony era, a ragtag group of teenagers are sent to Earth to help fight the Earth Alliance in Oz with their five super powerful Gundams. Along the way, the five Gundams must work together to free the space colonies or die trying, and you'll find one prefers the latter. Gundam Wing is slightly more traditional Gundam fare, but with less full-scale war and more isolated rebellions from oppressed space colonies. These five teens fighting for freedom in a literal queen slash princess pressing for total pacifism helped inject some more of the political drama that Gundam had been known for, but still pretty watered down by comparison. 
And a lot of people give <laughs> Gundam Wing a bunch of crap for the pacifism because, you know, fighting is wrong unless your 2x4 of a boyfriend has a sick Gundam he's just itching to self-destruct. Gundam Wing shows a slow transition into a story with slightly more mature content, serving as a bridge, or rather a step, from G Gundam into the Universal Century, or the upcoming year's Gundam X. Now you might be asking why I'm covering Gundam Wing after G Gundam, and that's probably because you're in the West. Fun fact, Gundam Wing actually aired first in the West, but after G Gundam in Japan, airing in 1995 and running until 1996. Well, no Polka Gundam, Wing did go through a few changes in the production process, such as changing the main protagonist from the super cool duo Maxwell to Hero 2x4 Yui, for some reason. Gundam Wing's staff drew inspiration from a lot of places, even Tim Burton. Writer Katsuki Sumizawa enjoyed a lot of Tim Burton's works, and wrote Troa Barton based off him, even mentioning in an interview, this is Tim Burton, somehow sad, but expressionless, which fits Troa to a T. Gundam Wing received some popularity in Japan, increasing its average rating from 4.1% with G Gundam to 4.3% with Wing. Bandai liked what G had achieved in tried to do the same, keeping five Gundams and five main characters, building off of what it had previously set up. This team's dynamic and some of the character designs made it a lot more popular among the female demographic than G Gundam was, and Gundam Wing found new life in the doujinshi world. Now, if you're unfamiliar with that term, welcome to the land of anime where you can self-publish content about existing stories and the vast majority of them end up being lewd, but that's okay. Romantic subplots are the most important thing in Gundam, apparently. I mean, how else are we gonna know how the love pentagon of Project Meteor happens? I mean, these boy bands, you know, they, they gotta, gotta be into each other. Gundam Wing also found limelight in the US, airing on Toonami's block of programming in March of 2000. Bandai wanted to build on the success of the model kit market that G had helped build up at this point, and while no clear numbers exist publicly, Gunpla would continue to grow on an upward trend even up until today, so likely to say that Wing at least helped a little bit. And while it really only serves as breadcrumbs to the UC, it does it well, and for a lot of people, it was a good jumping off point. However, for the people who would need one extra step, that step would prove to be broken on this staircase and they fell down a hole. After War Gundam X aired in 1996 to only 39 episodes, being cut short due to poor ratings. Gundam X takes place in the After War era, 15 years after the Seventh Space War, in which the Earth is decimated by numerous colony drops. The story follows a group of vultures or scavengers trying to protect new types in this universe. Yes, new types exist here and they still get the same raw deal that they did in the Universal Century. The Earth of Gundam X is mostly a wasteland littered with smaller villages populating a desolate world. Similar to the world of the Fallout series, there are a few groups claiming to be the long past governments of old, but it's mostly just individual groups fighting for survival. While this is a different, interesting take on the world of Gundam, it didn't connect with most fans for a few reasons. One of the biggest complaints just so happens to be caused by the aforementioned world it's set in. Much like Fallout, the technology on Earth is almost all from before the Seventh Space War with nothing new being created. Meaning that travel to space is increasingly rare if not impossible in most circumstances. Gallivanting on Earth much more than the prior stories left a lot of fans kind of bored. While G and Wing took place on Earth, they were almost consistently showing off different locations and doing a lot of different things. 
However, due to the situation in X, this wasn't possible as the main cast is pretty much all in one place at one time. Part of what makes the Fallout universe different than X, well, largely sharing a similar style of wasteland, is that it has more time to explore a vibrantly dusty setting. X doesn't get that luxury. Even spending a larger portion of its time on Earth, it really didn't do much with it. Failing to capture an audience ultimately led to the break in Bandai's armor, with X dropping down to an all-time low rating of 1.2 to 2.8% in the ratings, depending on the time slot. Due to these poor ratings, the time slot was changed out of a primetime evening block to an early morning block the next day. This would affect Sunrise's confidence in these new alternative universes, and would lead to one last attempt for Gundam Wing. The new mobile report Gundam Wing Endless Waltz OVAs came out in three parts in 1997. This is the only time in this generation that an alternative timeline gets a continuation in animation in any form. While serving as a direct sequel to the television series, some of the designs might lead fans to think otherwise. We see the Gundams in some of their support mobile suits sporting new looks due to Hajime Kotoki's redesigns being dubbed the Endless Waltz versions. These actually had a lot of success garnering their own Verkal line of model kits in the Master Grade series, and even got adapted into the Glory of Losers manga more recently. Well, G and Wing left a mark on Gundam, the franchise was in a tough spot by the turn of the century. Bandai's strategy of making more kid-appealing content worked for a while and even made huge impressions in the West, spanning one of the most lucrative and oversaturated toy markets in history. Trying to inch closer to the UC style of content with each new show had worked for some as they jumped directly from Wing into the UC, but the failing of X hurt this half-decade-long plan. X hadn't undone all the progress and really never aired in the West. However, this new alternative universe experiment was in uncertain times, to say the least. Now we enter an era of absence for alternative universes. From 1997 to 2002, we see no new alternative universe storylines, technically speaking. For the UC, we did get the Green Diver special movie, the Gundam Evolve shorts, and the ending of the OHMS team. However, things were a little odd at the end of this, as full-length Gundam series had been in a pretty bad spot after Gundam X. Bandai and Sunrise were expecting the next project to be a big success, and it is unfortunately one of the most divisive series in Gundam. Yoshiyuki Tomino's magnum opus Turn A Gundam wasn't the smashing success Bandai had hoped for to enter a new millennia and end the decade and century before. You see, Turn A was vastly different, and Tomino's storytelling at this point had become a little confusing, making it incredibly complex and leaving a bunch of really odd spots with storylines just being dropped in certain areas. Turn A wasn't everyone's cup of tea, and while it did better than Gundam X, it only got back to a 3% average television rating, half of what the Universal Century had done a decade prior. This wasn't great for Bandai, they were very confused and upset about this. However, Turn A has found a second life and a cult following within the Gundam community, much like F91 before it. It is incredibly different and unique take on Gundam, and while I wouldn't say it necessitates a view, it is incredibly interesting to see where Tomino was at this point and what he did with Gundam. It takes a lot of the Gundam norms, turns them on their head, and turns it again, just to make things confusing, but really fun. Definitely consider giving it a watch just so you kind of have a reference point. However, the next thing I may not be able to recommend is highly. This was followed up by the first live-action attempt in Gundam with live-action G-Savior the movie coming out of the West. 
not only did the West get the first live-action take at Gundam, we also almost ruined it for 20 years. Well, G-Savior isn't the absolute worst thing to come out ever, it is by no means the traditional content we've been used to with Gundam. It is kind of quirky and kind of fun to watch, but largely it is something most people forget about. Now, it is at this point that is a great transition to address the W-shaped elephant in the room. Gundam Wing aired in 2000 on Toonami, exposing the West to the glory that is Hero 2x4 Yui and his boy band Project Meteor. Then, Toonami brought us some of the heavy hitters in the Universal Century with Mobile Suit Gundam, the OAth MS Team, and 0080. All of this being followed up by Domon Kashu in 2002 as he fights for the gold in Giant Robot Curling. This is pretty crazy for the West. All of these had been made, so it was pretty easy to dub them and send them over, especially for the UC stuff that had been dubbed. But this was two full-length series and two large, or actually three full-length series and two large OVA series to come out in two years. That's pretty bananas even for Gundam. However, it did give the West what they were wanting. After Gundam Wing, they needed Gundam content and they threw as much as they could at them. Very successfully, I might add. As this pushed Bandai into a new market for toy sales. Bandai went all in on the North American releases of the Mobile Suit and Action series that had originally been started in 1999. While they originally had started only in toy stores, they did quickly expand to Walmart and Target, taking huge portions of the toy, toy aisle and lining them with G Gundam and Gundam Wing action figures. Well, this was initially a huge success for them, this would ultimately be the downfall for this toy line in North America and eventually in Japan. However, we'll cover that when we get there. Regardless of the success in the West, Gundam was in a strange spot as far as new content as Japan is going to always be the primary market for Gundam. This uncertainty was uneasy. And while we've covered up to 2002, things were about to change. The uncertainty in Japan would be blown away like a seed in the wind. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for part two that will eventually be coming. And let us know what your favorite alternative storyline is in the comments down below and why. As always, I've been the Spicer. This has been Ships and Stuff on the Gunpla Network, and keep on building.